Good morning, and welcome to the second part of our COVID-19 vaccine webinar. I'm Laura Chang, one of the anesthesiologists and intensivists in the Department of Perioperative Medicine and Anesthesiology. In our first session, we invited Dr. Katie Stevenson, an infectious disease specialist and vaccine and virology researcher who discussed the science, technology, and safety behind COVID-19 vaccines, and in particular, mRNA vaccines. If you missed that session, no worries. The entire recording is now posted on the Dartmouth-Hitchcock YouTube website. It's available for viewing and sharing with colleagues, friends, and family so that all may make a better and more informed decision about vaccination. Today, we'll discuss the logistics, allocation, and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, both within the state of New Hampshire as well as within the DHH system. To discuss these topics, I'm pleased and honored to introduce two of my DHH colleagues, Dr. Elizabeth Talbot and Dr. Michael Calderwood. Dr. Elizabeth Talbot is a professor of medicine, an infectious disease specialist, and the New Hampshire Deputy State Epidemiologist. Dr. Calderwood is also an infectious disease specialist, a, the regional epidemiologist for the DHH system, and the Associate Chief Quality Officer. We'll begin with a short didactic session by, a session by each of these individuals, and then we'll transition into another Q&A session. Similar to our first session, we will have a selection of pre-scripted questions, and we'll also field questions from the Q&A board. Time permitting, we'll get to a few questions that were also left over from our first session. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Talbot. Dr. Talbot, thank you. Thank you, Laura. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk about um, our um, vaccines, right? So in um, my slide that I hope you can see, uh, um, there is an intentional title chosen, safe, effective, and equitable. And indeed, Dr. Stevenson took on um, a lot of the aspects of, of safety, but I will also um, address that to a certain extent today. Um, so I am very gratified to be um, sharing this time with Dr. Calderwood. Um, I think that it'll be um, a nice way to complement each other's roles within the pandemic. Um, so I am a professor at, at, at Dartmouth, um, but I'm also uh, a the deputy state epidemiologist and, and really here representing that role, uh, especially as I am the um, uh, vaccine allocation strategy branch chief uh, for this current uh, pandemic. Our agenda for the didactic uh, is uh, intended to be um, abbreviated because we want to hear your questions, but we'll take on candidate uh, vaccine development, just an overview, uh, state allocation and distribution, and Dr. Calderwood would, would take on um, the Dartmouth-Hitchcock vaccine rollout and ongoing public safety measures. So some key reminders and talking points regarding vaccine development. Yes, these vaccines have been fast-tracked in a way we've never seen before for vaccines. However, I think that our best uh, talking points and the reality is that these have been held to the very same standards. Uh, researchers used uh, existing networks to conduct these vaccine trials. Manufacturing began uh, even while the clinical trials were underway. Um, and, and these happened largely because Operation uh, Warp Speed funding. I've often said, I think it's a very unfortunate name for a program that we're, we're to have trust in, but um, indeed, I think that um, this, this has been what's brought us to this, um, frankly, happy day of, of talking about the vaccines that might break the back of this pandemic. Um, mRNA vaccine technology was chosen because uh, these are faster to produce than tr traditional vaccines. Um, and the FDA, ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and our CDC um, agreed to prioritize review. So the same process, but, but really brought uh, in, into a very appropriate and, and rapid um, uh, timeline. These vaccines are a new tool for the prevention of COVID-19. Uh, these two vaccines now have received uh, FDA emergency use authorization. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, two doses given at least 21 days apart, and the, the Moderna vaccine over this weekend received uh, FDA EUA. This is two doses given at least 28 days apart. Um, both vaccines were tested in tens of thousands of adults from diverse backgrounds, 
including older adults, those with comorbidities, and quite appropriately, those um, from communities of color. Um, the clinical data show that both vaccines are simply uh, safe and effective. Um, for me, it's been surprising just how many similarities there are between these vaccines as opposed to differences. Of course, they're both an mRNA platform. They are both effective in the 95% range. Uh, and we're able to see that they protect elderly as well. Um, the latest data shows the elderly cohort was protected at a range of about 86% for Moderna. Both vaccines also are showing uh, protection against severe disease in those who have breakthrough disease. They have similar side effects, uh, and, and these appear to be more after the second dose. And we have uh, trial data from at least eight weeks after second dose, which is um, important given that um, most vaccine side effects do occur in that short interval. We also have the same unknowns regarding these vaccines. For example, the duration of protection. Um, we have um, some subgroups have, who have not um, been included in a way that gives us confidence in data um, right now, which is um, those in pregnancy, uh, uh, children less than 16, immunocompromised persons. Um, we also don't know whether these vaccines are preventing asymptomatic disease, which is important for this uh, virus, which of course has um, a significant proportion of cases uh, with asymptomatic illness. And we also don't know whether it's present preventing um, secondary transmission. So um, we have a lot to learn, but there are um, some very exciting features, very reassuring features uh, of these uh, vaccines. The differences are mostly operational, such as the ultra cold versus the cold chain in Pfizer and Moderna, respectively. Um, they each use slightly different uh, mRNA and nanoparticles. Um, the uh, Pfizer vaccine was studied in those who are 16 and older, whereas Moderna is 18 and older, and the FDA EUAs included those age cutoffs for each. Um, and then, of course, the, the dosing as alluded, 30 micrograms, 21 days apart, and 100 micrograms, 28 days apart for um, the Pfizer and Moderna, respectively. There will be an unprecedented ongoing attention to safety as these vaccines roll out. Um, the manufacturers have agreed um, to monitor safety, have clinical trial follow-up for those who receive vaccine for two years. Um, we will also um, exploit the existing systems and data systems that are used to um, monitor safety of vaccines. Most are familiar with VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, but there are others as well. There's also the new CDC vSafe program, which is an opt-in text messaging system that actively seeks uh, the vaccine recipient's uh, experiences every day for a week, then once a week, and then three months for a year. There will also be very large database interrogations looking for um, usual vaccine uh, adverse events um, that have happened with others, um, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, although we've seen no such signal for that um, to date. Um, and this will go on for months in a very um, organized way uh, following the campaign. In one example of attention to safety, um, everyone has heard of the uh, issue of anaphylaxis and anaphylactoid reactions um, being promoted within the lay press and uh, in, in media reports. It's interesting given that um, no such reactions were seen in either trial. There were two uh, events of anaphylaxis within the Moderna trial, but one occurred in a placebo recipient and the other was in a vaccine recipient, but it was 63 days after the second dose, so it felt um, very unlikely to be related. So far in the vaccine campaign, campaign uh, internationally, there have been six instances of anaphylaxis or anaphylactoid reaction among uh, nearly a quarter million doses administered. Um, we have some uh, clear attention to this possible safety signal. The FDA affirmed that the vaccine should be used with no new restrictions. They are closely monitoring and we should expect updated fact sheets and prescribing information to reflect any evolving information. CDC recommends that persons who receive 
the vaccine should be observed after their vaccination. If you have a history of anaphylaxis due to any cause, you should um, be observed for 30 minutes and all other persons 15 minutes. So regarding allocation, this is highly subject to change, but I think it's quite um, intuitive for you all that um, we have very limited supply of vaccine in these early days. So in this graphic, um, I, I think uh, you know we're just starting out and, and the limited doses indicate we need to have a um, highly targeted administration, which we're electing through closed settings such as places of work and other vaccine sites um, that are specific to clearly defined priority populations. We all are very eager to be in that middle band, at least where we have large number of doses available. And it's even hard to wrap ourselves around the notion that we will move to a routine vaccination strategy like um, many of our other vaccines. Um, so we look forward to those days. But for now, we need to have a very clear and uh, transparent allocation process in our own state, New Hampshire, um, I, I want to let you know that this has been founded on decades of planning for such. Um, there are many pandemic plans that have been worked through by many of the people still at the helm of this current um, public health emergency. Um, the process is driven by a dedicated multidisciplinary vaccine allocation strategy branch. It's supported by an internal and external partner group of experts called the um, State Disaster Medical Advisory Committee. Um, and of course is reviewed by senior state leadership. Um, and um, indeed it's, it's been dynamic, but um, there are clearly guiding procedural principles such as fairness. Um, this requires engagement with the public, particularly those most affected by the pandemic and impartial decision-making. Um, an even-handed application of allocation uh, criteria and uh, priority categories, transparency, including our obligation to communicate to the public openly, clearly, accurately, and straightforwardly about the allocation framework as it's being developed, deployed, and yes, modified. And we're trying to be, of course, evidence-based. Uh, this is challenging in our current era where we get um, information um, in as fast as it's available, but um, certainly not with um, the, the usual outlets, um, for example, hearing things through the media first and trying very, diff very hard to um, find those evidence um, uh, out there in peer review way. Our guiding ethical principles are maximum benefit, equal concern, uh, that requires every person be considered and treated as having equal dignity, worth, and value. That is, we're not valuing um, the protection of an infant over um, an, an elderly person. Um, and then um, mitigation of health inequities, including the obligation to explicitly address the higher burden of this disease experienced by populations affected most heavily given their exposure and compounding and long-standing health inequities. So, we do acknowledge the impact of systemic racism and structural inequities on historically marginalized communities, including the and most significantly communities of color. We're le leveraging information from multiple sources, um, some of which are highlighted here and available through the active links that will be available to you. Um, so <clears throat> practically speaking, this means we're ensuring information is available um, through, through many mechanisms, including websites. Uh, we're updating frequently. We're um, using multiple languages to do so um, and taking attention to create culturally responsive messaging. Um, we're funding community health workers in both local health departments, Nashua and Manchester, to work within their, their own communities to provide support and education. And we're engaging with community leaders um, who are the best to engage with their own communities. So our framework has a twofold goal. So first to reduce severe morbidity and mortality, but also to reduce the negative societal impact due to transmission of disease. So our allocation criteria consider risk in four ways. The risk of acquiring infection, such as healthcare workers in the trenches. Um, the risk of severe morbidity and mortality especially those who are elderly or with medical comorbidities. Um, negative societal impact um, where disease can threaten uh, societal function, perhaps like the nuclear power plant. 
and the risk of transmitting infection and amplifying infection um, and, and driving um, the infection further, such as teachers. And this has led us to four allocation phases. I know many of you have already seen this online um, uh, review within our plan, considered really to be um, uh, dynamic, um, so changing. Um, we're uh, in 1A now, as you can't help but know, um, and Dr. Calderwood will particularly speak about um, how high-risk health workers, um, such, such as many people on, on the, this meeting, will be um, receiving their vaccine in the days to come. Um, we're providing information, also technical assistance, if you will, um, regarding how to prioritize even the at-risk. There is not enough vaccine to give everybody within the populations as shown in the previous slide. So we are needing to, to provide guidance um, such as prioritizing based on occupational and personal risk, choosing, for example, high risk uh, or most risk at, at risk health workers who have high, who disclose that they have um, high risk medical conditions themselves over the age of 65, working on COVID units. In some settings, our health workers are working without inadequate, without adequate personal protective equipment. We're looking at the populations that are disproportionately affected, such as already alluded in the um, statements around equity, those who can't telework. And emerging is um, the intuitive um, decision to um, advise that it might be right to vaccinate those first who have no evidence of having had COVID-19 in the last three months. The purpose for this is recognizing that in the first three months after confirmed infection, there may be some residual infection protection, and therefore those who have no uh, known history of, of COVID-19 might be preferentially uh, vaccinated. Um, so the question I get everywhere from every way is when will I get vaccinated? Um, Indeed, phase 1A is finalized and in process. Phase 1B is in an advanced draft, but we need to talk about what happened even last night. Phase two is pending. Uh, we're using those sources as mentioned with the framework online, but it is likely that um, this will change as well. So last night, an email from uh, Dr. Nancy Massanier, the director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Disease, um, let us know first the um, uh, guidance given by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. The slide has quotes around it because I indeed cut from the email. Um, earlier today, ACIP met and had a robust discussion around the next priority groups based on their discussion. Uh, ACIP voted that when COVID-19 vaccine supply is limited, which it is, the following groups should be offered. So in 1B, they are suggesting persons age 75 and older and frontline essential workers, which appears to be somewhat tightly defined for them. They're suggesting a 1C phase as well, which captures those in um, a, a slightly younger, older age category, um, and then persons uh, 16 to 64 with high-risk medical conditions, which are um, defined by CDC, and then other uh, categories of essential workers. Um, this may be published in an MMWR as early as today. So we will uh, very quickly digest this guidance and see how it aligns with the um, uh, New Hampshire situation, that is with regards to our epidemiology and, and also our uh, process as described. So this is a very nimble partnership that's looking to distribute. We expect at the state that 75% of our vaccines will be distributed through non-governmental uh, channels such as uh, hospitals, traditional healthcare providers who are able to register today to be vaccine providers, and then pharmacies. Um, uh, all of the commercial pharmacies are registering to be providers, so there will be a familiarity in achieving vaccination through that um, venue. And then 25% will be through um, the state government, uh, such as through our state drive through fixed sites, which are standing now. Um, I think there are 11 such. Um, and then our regional public health networks um, have organized for mobile strike teams to reach persons who um, cannot come to the fixed sites or the other more traditional venues for vaccination. So um, in 1A, hospitals are vaccinating their health workers, pharmacies and regional public health workers will also vaccinate uh, in the long-term care facilities. And then the fixed sites will reach ambulatory care and first responders. 
Um, we received vaccine last Monday, one week. It's remarkable. Um, this has been directed, as you know, to hospitals and long-term care. Um, we've provided guidance, which is available through our health alert network and, and various ways online. Um, Moderna is expected today. Uh, we issued a HAN last night uh, regarding um, specifics of this vaccine. And um, we're expecting this week about 33,000 doses between Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, and, and Moderna. In bold is the uh, statement, this is subject to change depending on what the uh, federal government supplies us. So again, this is um, where you can see the um, technical assistance documents and the plan. Uh, as I've alluded, there are FAQs. There's information for lots of different partners in, in culturally appropriate uh, ways and language. So if you drop down on our main um, website, you will see resources and guidance and COVID-19 planning, so uh, uh, vaccination planning. So please, if that's helpful, um, take a look at that. I look forward to your questions and for Dr. Calderwood's comments. Thank you very much. All right, so now I come off mute. So hopefully you all can see my slides. As Elizabeth said, I am going to be um, discussing uh, the DHH vaccine rollout. There will be um, some high level uh, specifics that may not be relevant to all on today's call, but um, will be uh, appropriate for those of our high risk health workers uh, that are listening in today. We're also gonna talk about some of the ongoing public uh, safety measures that are gonna be needed throughout this vaccine rollout. And until we achieve um, really this level of herd immunity, and I'll talk a little bit about what that might entail, we're gonna to need to do a lot of the same things that we've been doing up till now to make sure that we're keeping um, each other safe. So um, if I can move forward on my slide, there we go. So as said before, uh, we are currently in uh, phase 1A. This is the uh, jumpstart phase. And I've highlighted in red the um, area I'm gonna focus on, which is the at-risk health workers. And there are two groups within this. The most risk, these are our frontline clinical staff who provide direct patient care, as well as support staff with uh, risk of exposure to bodily fluids or aerosols. We're also focused on uh, moderate risk, those in healthcare settings with indirect or limited patient contact, um, but also in a higher risk uh, than uh, say some in the general public. It's a big number. If we just look at those in the most risk category, there are more than 20,000 um, within the state of New Hampshire. And that's just in hospital settings. And there's a very large group of healthcare workers outside of hospital settings, in ambulatory practices, in home care settings. And so there are a lot of people that are going to need to um, receive vaccine. However, I am encouraged by the initial numbers. And um, so we had heard from Dr. Talbot about um, allotments to the state, and these continue to come in with each week, these are divided. So obviously you see here, some are going to go to long-term care, some are gonna to go to first responders, but we had close to 4,900 doses of the Pfizer vaccine available to hospitals in week one. In week two, which is the week we are entering right now, we're expecting another 4,300 doses of the Pfizer vaccine, a little over 8,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine. And if I use Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center as an example, we uh, administered 300 doses in the first two days of standing up our clinics with plans to administer 650 more doses this week and close to 1,000 doses next week. So we are rapidly ramping up our ability to deliver this vaccine. As well, we have other members within the DHH system um, that are on target to finish administering all 300 doses, that was their initial allotment by today, with additional doses available this week. And so all those other sites will be continuing to help with this effort. This has been a robust and iterative process that still goes on. We actually um, have groups that are meeting three times a week to make sure that we are uh, getting this right. 
We are acting upon uh, guidance, both nationally and at the state level, um, coming down from uh, groups such as CDC and the advisory group ACIP, as well as um, uh, New Hampshire DHHS, thinking about who we should be prioritizing. Within the hospital, we've taken our list of employees at a PeopleSoft, we've sorted by departments, roles, and location. And we've had a multidisciplinary team that really has been working to prioritize based on how frequently employees might be exposed as well as the type of exposure. And so one thing that we're really focused on is who is doing higher risk procedures that may put them at higher risk of acquisition of COVID-19. We've had input from directors and clinical leaders um, around uh, the system, and we've continued to validate to make sure that we're not missing employees from the list and to make sure uh, that we don't have folks on the list that are no longer working um, in those high risk positions. I will come back in a few slides to kind of show you um, if you feel you should have been on the list. Um, we have an email that you can write to. Um, and again, we are meeting three times a week. Um, so this is not set in stone. We continue to reevaluate. As a very high level, and what I can say is behind this high level are very detailed um, kind of Excel sheets. But just so people get a sense of where we're looking, Group A, the group kind of that started last week, was focused on um, our teams that have been providing some of the frontline care uh, for COVID patients in the healthcare setting. Hospital medicine, ICU, anesthesia, who are involved in intubation, our ED and urgent care providers, and those working in COVID test sites. Within this, we've included um, graduate medical education. So these are our residents and fellows, nurses, others in uh, respiratory uh, care, respiratory therapy, as well as most risk professionals in these areas. Within group B, we expand out to pediatric hospital medicine and ICU. We thankfully have not had uh, very many children hospitalized with COVID-19. That's been uh, the experience uh, for many. Um, but then we're also focused on those who are participating in uh, procedures that put them at higher risk, those performing aerosol generating procedures. These are gonna be groups like GI with endoscopy and pulmonary with bronchoscopy, cardiology, ob surgery, and other interventional areas. In group C, we're looking at inpatient teams not vaccinated above, including non-clinical frontline workers in the most risk of exposure categories as defined in uh, the state appendices. And finally, in group D are our consulting services and ambulatory. We're working to make sure that we are um, equitable. And for instance, we know we have urgent care in many areas across the system. And so making sure that we can get vaccine where it needs to go at each of these levels um, has been a big focus. I do wanna highlight though, that there's a plan to vaccinate all phase 1A staff in the next one to two months. And so, well, you're seeing here a tiered approach. We really are working to get all of our healthcare workers vaccinated quite quickly. Staff are receiving email invitations. They're staggered to help manage the calls to the scheduling line. I will, I will joke and say that um, we actually have had people praise our scheduling, which is something we never really see, um, but that was nice to see. Um, you will not have a choice about which vaccine you receive. And I do want to highlight that. We are getting vaccine, um, and it's either right now Pfizer or Moderna. We may get to a point where we have other vaccines that are available. But on a given day, you will get what we have on hand. Employees are encouraged to get the vaccine, but not required. And when you get your email, um, the invitation is going to come with a number of vaccine um, uh, fact sheets, kind of one for the Pfizer vaccine, one for the Moderna vaccine. They're actually very similar, um, as uh, Dr. Talbot kind of spoke about, M many more similarities than differences. There are also some FAQ documents. We've had a number of experts across the system um, weighing in on issues, say, related to pregnancy and allergy. And then there'll be instructions on scheduling. We are recommending that staff uh, try and get the vaccine um, either um, before a day off um, or on a day off. The reason for that is um, we know from the trials that uh, the most common side effect is a sore arm. And um, 
it is a little bit more um, in terms of the frequency uh, than the flu vaccine, but really lasts only about one to two days. And then there are some people who get um, some symptoms that are like a viral illness, and that really is temporary. And these side effects are what is happening is your body is developing immunity. But because of that, because some people feel fatigued, some people may have a fever, um, we want the ability for people to take a day off if they need to after the vaccine. We also um, tell people that the vaccination process may take a little bit longer than you're used to. This is not kind of show up, get the shot and walk away. We have a short period of observation. Um, we had a wonderful launch last week. Um, it was jubilant, the, the palpable sense of relief on providers faces as they got the vaccine. And we had um, no anaphylaxis immediate reactions, but obviously we wanna be careful and make sure we're observing for that. And so there'll be a period where uh, you're asked to wait uh, for a brief period of obser observation. We ask that staff not forward invitations to their coworkers. Um, again, this is being done in a uh, specific order to make sure that we can get uh, vaccine appropriately out to all that need it uh, in a timeline. If you feel um, that you should have received an invitation, we ask that you first wait a couple of days, again, because these are staggered. And so it may be that you actually are going to receive an invitation. It just hasn't come yet. Um, but if you feel that uh, sufficient time has gone on, you can um, write to our HR department um, and ask, you know, why was myself or my group not included? And we're happy to, to look that over. If an employee has any persistent side effects kind of lasting beyond that uh, two-day period we might expect, um, we ask you contact occupational medicine. Um, we are uh, recording and reporting uh, all of those, and we can help you to work through uh, any of those side effects. It also is critical that staff get a second dose. Um, it was explained earlier, um, this will either be a day 21 or day 28, depending on which vaccine you get. It's interesting, in the Pfizer vaccine trial, they looked at um, uh, kind of reduction in COVID cases from seven days after the second uh, vaccine. In the Moderna trial, it was 14 days after the, the uh, second shot. What we mean by immune is that staff are not going to need to quarantine if exposed. And this has been a, um, a big impact on our uh, healthcare workforce when we've had exposures and people had to be out initially for 14 days, now roll back to, to 10. Um, but these are individuals that are no longer able to uh, work on the front lines and provide care for all of the patients that are coming in uh, to our facilities. But I do wanna say, once you're vaccinated, you do still need to wear the universal PPE and to follow all other mitigation measures. And that includes things like our travel policy. And the reason for this is that the vaccine is wonderfully effective. It's 95% effective, but there are people that once vaccinated still did get illness. And when they had illness, they tended to have much milder illness. They were less likely to be um, hospitalized or intubated or even die. And that's the wonderful thing about this vaccine, but it means you may not know that you have a risk to transmit to others. And there are gonna be many in the community who either have uh, not yet been vaccinated or have chosen to hold on vaccine uh, for a period of time. And so we need to think about um, the mask and the social distancing and all we do uh, to protect those until we get that level of herd immunity. So what, is, what do I mean by herd immunity? So to date, um, New Hampshire test sites have tested almost, done almost a million tests. And there have been over 35,000 cases of COVID-19. If you actually calculate, um, it, is, it could be as high as 196 to 197,000 true infections. And so we know that for every test we're doing and every case we're identifying, there are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic individuals in the community who are not being tested. And so the number that we actually are identifying is the tip of the iceberg. And there are some cases we have uh, yet to identify or not identify. Overall, it may be as much as 14% of the New Hampshire population has been exposed to this virus. But to get to herd immunity, we're told that we need to achieve a 70% exposure, which means that we would need to vaccinate almost 950,000 people just in the state of New Hampshire. And that's a big number. And this can be done 
but it's going to take a great effort and it's going to take many, many months. There is an estimate that this could be achieved by late summer, and I'm talking about August to maybe even September of uh, 2021, excuse me, we're going into a new year. Um, and so I do wanna highlight that, that we are going to be uh, dealing with uh, a lot of the same measures uh, for a long period of time. What about the community? Once we move into later phases and we think about vaccinating the community at large, um, our patients and public health clinics, DHMC is expecting that we'll be able to vaccinate over 500 people a day with additional capacity at other system sites. We're gonna be doing this in the colder winter months. So initially um, this will presumably be indoors, moving to drive-through vaccine clinics like we did uh, for flu beginning in May and on. Um, our pharmacy has uh, cold storage freezers that actually can handle uh, the distribution challenges. We have this at multiple sites. Um, across the state. So that will help us uh, to move this vaccine uh, around to where it needs to be delivered. We will communicate with patients and the public when the vaccine is available. Similar to what you're seeing on pharmacies right now where they have signs up and saying vaccine not yet available. We ask that you please do not call your primary care physician's office. They do not have vaccine right now and we will make it known when that is available and where you can come to get that vaccine. And I wanna end with kind of what we still need to be doing. So we each have a role to play. So as we think about how we get this virus under control and we expect things to continue to get worse through February into March before we begin to plateau and begin to see the impacts of the vaccine in April and beyond. The first is universal masking. We have mask mandates, but we have to be thinking about carpools, sports, gatherings with people outside your immediate family. It's estimated that 55,000 US deaths could be prevented by April 1st if we were to improve our mask wearing and 600 deaths here just in the state of New Hampshire. We need to be washing our hands. The virus itself can survive on human skin for eight to 10 hours, can survive a little bit longer if you've got mucus, if you've sneezed into your hands. It is completely inactivated with 15 seconds of a hand rub with alcohol sanitizer. You can use soap and water. What we're seeing is the coronavirus hand washing effect, and we really like that. 78% of Americans are now washing their hands six or more times a day, but this is something we need to continue. People keep saying, did the holidays have an impact? And here's just the data from New Hampshire. You see there in mid-November that we were beginning to plateau, and then you see a large jump in the New Hampshire daily case counts in the 14 days following Thanksgiving, particularly notable on December 2nd and onward, which is following that five to seven day typical incubation period before you become sym symptomatic. We're gonna have the same guidance for December holidays. Stay home, stay safe. If we're seeing travel like we saw for some around Thanksgiving, we're gonna have yet another spike and the country as a whole cannot handle another spike. Finally, I'm gonna end with social distancing. There's a wonderful um, model at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I've given the website there for folks who wanna play around with it. For those who've gathered, um, and as we've moved into colder months, we're seeing more of this indoor gathering. This is a typical living room um, where you have six individuals, you've got no ventilation, the windows are closed, the doors are closed, no one in that room is wearing a mask. If one individual in that room has COVID, and no one is wearing masks over a four hour period, it is estimated that everyone in that room will have been exposed. If however, the people in that room are wearing a mask, you provide some ventilation, open doors, open window, and you shorten uh, the duration from four hours to two hours, so shorter is better, you can get down to transmission to less than one person. I really do wanna highlight that. These are the things that we're gonna to need to continue to do. I have a lot of hope for this vaccine. I think we're gonna get it out uh, to everyone who needs it, but it's going to take a period of time and we're gonna to need to keep being smart until we get a sufficient number of people vaccinated. So thank you. Michael and Elizabeth, thank you so much. That was really informative. 
um, both on the allocation distribution as well as mitigation strategies that we can continue to practice. Um, I think one big takeaway for me in terms of distribution and allocation is that even though the coronavirus is novel, it sounds like the planning is not, and that's reassuring um, in the sense that it will be fair and equitable um, and, and well-managed. And I think we found the same in our first session that the, although it sounds mRNA and vaccine technology sounds novel to us, it's actually been around for um, quite some time. I think when we think about questions that would come up today, there are three buckets. Um, one would deal with the approval of the vaccine itself and that process. The second, questions that providers have about um, immunizing their patients. And then questions that providers or people in our community have um, themselves about when they may receive the vaccine. And we've touched on this a lot, um, when or how and if, I think the question would be. So I'm gonna start with some of the higher level more national approval questions. And I think I'll direct these to um, Dr. Talbot first, but Dr. Caldwell, feel free to jump in. And the first question we have is, can you tell us what is the difference between FDA approval and emergency use, use authorization? I think there's a lot of questions because you'll get that sheet that says, this is not FDA approved. What does that mean? And what's the difference in the rigor of um, review? Um, so FDA has a mechanism since 9-11 actually for um, emergency use authorization. Um, and it's expected that the vaccines will come to full approval. Um, but in fact, the, the process is essentially the same with accelerated time points. They have the option, according to Commissioner Hahn uh, of the FDA, to approve vaccines for e with an EUA with a lower standard, but they have elected not to do that for this uh, series of vaccines it's incredibly important to have the public trust. Uh, so, so I believe it wholeheartedly in the process that's been used uh, as, as essentially the same as the usual approval method. Awesome, that's extremely reassuring, I think, to all of us. And on a similar topic of kind of trust in transparency um, and how the um, scientific and, and governmental communities are reviewing these things, can you talk a little bit about um, the VAERS and the vaccine safety database when uh, adverse report, uh, events are reported, will those go straight to the you know, governmental organizations? Will the medical community be aware? When will the public find out? What's the plan in that regard? I use the example of this anaphylaxis anaphylactoid reaction um, to show how nimble this is intended to be and seems to be so that those have happened in less than a week and we've had multiple federal announcements and adjustment to guidance as a result. So um, I, I, I think that the plans, the multiple redundant systems as I alluded in slides are, are fully intended to reassure public but also provide us what we need to know in order to safely administer this in um, a kind of um, responsiveness that we haven't seen before. So indeed, VAERS is in place and a whole bunch of other new systems with uh, all eyes on uh, safety and transparency. Great, thank you. Again, very reassuring. So we have a number of, um, of providers um, watching today, particularly primary care providers. And um, the question of high risk or comorbid conditions comes up a lot. And I know that both of you spoke to that those um, conditions are well outlined. But I was wonder, wondering if you could mention first where we could find the list of conditions. And then there was actually a very interesting question posed about mental health and where that falls into the spectrum of comorbid conditions, as we know that um, the mental health of many of our um, community residents has taken a toll during this past nine months. Um, I'll feel that to, it looks like Dr. Caldwell might be available to speak on that question. Sure, and this is coming up in the uh, Q&A um, as well. And so the CDC, since the beginning of this, has kept a um, kind of running uh, website, and we can put that uh, in, in a link to provide to others to look at. And so, you know, there are things that early on um, we maybe not have had on the list, like pregnancy. We've gotten a lot more information through uh, the pandemic to really understand the impact of this virus on those uh, who are pregnant. Um, in fact, this has come out a lot around vaccine to say, well, should they have been included in these vaccine trials? Um, and while they typically, as was mentioned on Friday, um, have not, we now have questions of um, you know, the safety in that group. We heard again a lot about that uh, on Friday, and we're happy to talk more about that. 
So I think we continue to learn about um, the medical comorbidities that put people at risk, but clearly there are uh, societal um, uh, risk factors as well. And so communal living um, situations. And so depending on, you know, we've focused a lot on uh, nursing homes and there's been obviously in the fall, a lot of focus on uh, colleges, um, but mental health and um, communal living um, for those who live in that sort of setting, that clearly is going to be a risk. And so we need to think about um, how we are vaccinating uh, those who really can't socially distance to make sure that we are providing a, a level of protection early on. Great, thank you. Um, so in a, in a similar vein, Dr. Talbot, if I'm a primary care physician and I, you know, I, we're saying don't call your PCP, but people are calling and it, do I, you know, is hypertension a comorbid condition, a high risk condition? You know, I have end stage renal, that seems, you know, what, where can I go if I'm a PCP to find out that list and at least provide some guidance or reassurance to my patients? CDC has kept this running list and it's available for anyone to see on their website. So um, it's dynamic and, and we are going to adhere closely to it. Um, actually with, with one important exception, which is uh, just as Dr. Calder would mention, pregnancy as, as a now recognized um, medical comorbidity, if you will, for, for significant morbidity and mortality in this infection. So also, are uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So um, although significant medical comorbidities require two such conditions in our very first priority group, that's not the case for intellectual and um, developmental disabilities. That, that alone uh, puts that person into a setting of uh, highest priority for vaccination in the next uh, phase. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, Similarly, we did have uh, several questions regarding immunocompromised status or those who are caregivers for immunocompromised status. Would, the, do you get to pull someone along, right? So you're in a um, group home perhaps, or maybe you have a caregiver who comes in to the home. Um, should that, given we don't know that um, whether or not the virus can still be transmitted or we actually suspect that it can be, would that person be bumped up? And how does that happen? Who decides that? So you want to answer, I was going to say that there's been a lot of focus on home care and caregiver, but you may want to speak to that. Uh, indeed, and, and we recognize that um, it's, it's the function and not the um, employer or title or, or what, you know, when we talk about phase 1A, at-risk health workers are, are those who um, touch a patient who um, are in patient setting areas. So please do look at the technical assistance to see how um, we have thought about this in the allocation branch, um, but, but we call out very specifically within the appendix of the technical assistance that personal care aides and home health aides um, and, and such caregivers are indeed at-risk health workers um, who will be met within the 1A phase. Um, so there, there's the question of whether um, a family member who's caring for, for such a vulnerable person would be covered in 1A. And in fact, um, those will be uh, considered within a later phase. Um, but congregate settings will, will be widely captured um, because we've seen the devastation of transmission within those kinds of settings in New Hampshire's epidemiology. So following it closely, a little bit of nuances just discussed, but I hope it's transparent in the plans that are online. Great, thank you so much. So um, let's just shift gears a little bit. We've mentioned a lot, I mean, people who have had COVID-19 within the last three months are now being advised to hold, hopefully hold back. Is that an honor system um, for, uh, protocol or um, should people get tested? Maybe I have a family member who had COVID, I never had symptoms. Should I get, uh, should I get antibody tested first? What's the guidance around that? I'll let uh, Dr. Calder would speak to the DH community, but, but I don't, I would just say we are not asking people to get antibody tested for sure. That that that's not the right approach here, um, and and some of it in a statewide is intended to be um, enacted by employers and providers. So honor system indeed. No no proof of vaccine of of actual infection needed to to decide on queuing. But um, uh, Michael, why don't you take the local context? 
Yeah, and this has been uh, something that's been discussed for a long time, even before we had the vaccine, which is this idea of the antibody is a good test, um, kind of two weeks beyond where you may have been exposed to say, you know, were you exposed? But we don't know what it actually means in terms of immunity, either short-term or long-term. Um, and so this question of if you have been exposed, known illness, diagnosed illness, or had antibodies, should you still get vaccinated? Um, we know in the trials that um, in the short term, um, those that at the time of enrollment um, tested positive had similar results in the vaccine and the placebo arm. Um, so that you know, does speak to this protection potentially in that three month period. But I think I was very uh, encouraged by the data that Dr. Stevenson showed on Friday about the potential for long-term immunity with these mRNA vaccines. And so we really are uh, encouraging everyone uh, to get vaccinated, even if they previously had COVID-19. Again, just because we don't know how long the immunity is after a natural infection, and we think it may be longer with the vaccine. Within specific groups, um, there is the ability to say we have a finite number of vaccines. We are going to prioritize those first who've never had COVID and vaccinate those later who've had it, say, in the last few months. For healthcare workers, um, we are, because we're really trying to get everyone vaccinated in the next one to two months, we're vaccinating everyone regardless of whether they've had uh, COVID before. Great, thank you. So my next question has to do with people who may be on the fence about getting vaccinated. Let's say my group comes up. And you know what, I'm not com completely convinced that I want the vaccine right now. Do I forfeit my place in line? What if, you know, a month later I said, you know what, I really want that vaccine. I'm in group 1A. Can I get it at the end of January, at the end, beginning of February? Um, or have I lost my chance? No, we, we've had a lot of discussions about that. And so um, individuals who kind of decide to wait and then a month later or however long later want to come back in, you come back in at the priority level uh, you were in when you were originally offered the vaccine. Great, I think that's really reassuring. Um, and again, emphasizing that we are supporting everyone's individual choice. Dr. Talbot, um, I have a question for you. Regarding, so New Hampshire is somewhat unique um, in that we are a very rural state and many of our um, community members are not that well plugged into um, the healthcare system despite our best efforts. And I mean, I know that in the operating room daily, I'll have patients who, um, don't have any other conditions because they haven't seen a physician in, in decades, perhaps. Um, and I know you spoke a little bit to outreach to um, underrepresented um, communities. How is the state planning on achieving herd immunity when we have such a rural location and those who may or may not have PCPs? Um, thank you for the question. I, I, it's something that um, does um, get our attention every day. And this is why we have these redundant approaches for vaccination, yeah? So we, we see it unfolding over time for the general population to be, um, sometimes you're called into a closed site, you know, we're reaching out to you as we're talking now, but, but then there will be also um, passive ways that people can be, be vaccinated through commercial pharmacies, as mentioned, urgent cares are equipping. Today is the day for primary care providers to register as providers through routine ways. Um, our city health departments, um, we will have these fixed sites equitably distributed throughout our state. Um, and then these mobile strike teams. So looking for a lot of different ways to vaccinate folks. Um, and all through it, a 10% holdback of our vaccine supply to achieve equity. And, and that's a very intentional um, approach to looking at where we have pockets of poverty and our tracks of uh, communities that are more likely to have been disproportionately impacted by virtue of their ethnic or cultural minority. Yeah. Great, Great. thank you so much. Um, in a, a similar vein of questioning, we do have to acknowledge also um, New Hampshire has several uh, institutions of higher learning. How does the state, how does the healthcare system look at these um, university students who appear and then disappear, but at the same time um, are at risk and uh, both to be infected by COVID and to transmit? And how do you go about um, devising a vaccine strategy? Maybe uh, Dr. Talbot, you wanna speak first, perhaps and Dr. Um, Calderwood, um, given the relationship between DHH and Dartmouth. 
I, I hear the question as specific to settings of higher learning, but I first want to say um, teachers, uh, staff at schools, um, and, and eventually students um, will, will be targeted at the K to 12, um, probably uh, residential schools first, given the um, uh, ready spread throughout those um, facilities. Um, but, but we've already included school nurses in, in 1A as people who touch patients and are at risk of acquiring and also have a role in transmitting if, if to be infected. So in, in terms of uh, settings of higher learning, such as Dartmouth College or um, UNH and et cetera, um, the, the staff will be coming to attention for vaccination by virtue of um, their comorbidities, their age, um, and, and, and then by um, uh, in, in a later phase um, because of their setting. We, we will take schools on in a dedicated way. You can find them listed out in our current draft plan, um, which, which has to con come under this continual scrutiny, um, especially given the uh, email as alluded yesterday. It's a really dynamic time um, and we're doing the best we can to keep up with that, but uh, trust that schools uh, of, of all ilk will be um, included in, in this effort. Yeah, I, I will just speak um, quickly to uh, medical students. Um, we obviously have uh, built into our um, prioritization, our uh, graduate medical education, our residents and our fellows, um, but uh, medical students who come in, particularly in their clinical years, um, we are working out a process to make sure that they are uh, vaccinated, particularly as they're coming into um, higher risk settings where they're going to be involved in aerosol generating procedures. So there's work right now going on uh, to make sure that they are included in this first wave. And thanks for that, because it's is an op opportunity to say, indeed, it's not your employer. It's not whether you're a student or, or paid at the high scale or what, it's, it's your role. So that seems very appropriate to me and something we've called out repeatedly. It's, it's your function and, and not your employer or your status or whatever. Great. So I'm trying to represent a wide range of um, viewpoints here. And so the um, next question comes from those who are concerned that when will this vaccine be mandatory, right? Whether you work at DHH and you know that the flu vaccine is mandatory, or if you're in the community and perhaps an essential worker, um, do we have a sense of when the COVID vaccine will become mandatory and what would have to happen for that um, to occur? Dr. Talbot, do you want to start with the state's stance on that? And perhaps Dr. Calder could mention DHH's policy. Um, we have no trajectory for which this will become mandatory at a state level. We are aware, um, as always, that um, individual employers can, can take this decision. But right now, we are um, focused on getting people the information they need such that they would want to get this vaccine. You know, part, part what we're doing right now, even, is is that transparency, being able to talk about concerns and, and hopefully move people to voluntary to, uh, vac vaccination. But um, there's, there's no plan for, for the state's uh, jurisdiction and, uh, to, to enact uh, mandatory. But I think um, Dr. Calder will, will take on the uh, cogitations locally. No, I think we're in the, the same spot. Obviously we have um, mandated certain um, vaccines for uh, employment and so flu is one um, that in some facilities has been mandated for a period of time. We obviously have a lot more data on those vaccines over years and years and we've given to millions and millions of people and so we know kind of the long-term efficacy and safety of those. Um, I will say what's interesting is uh, the flu vaccine is not as efficacious as uh, we're seeing early on in these COVID vaccines. Um, so a lot more effectiveness of these vaccines. But again, we wanna make sure we understand this long-term safety data. We are hearing nationally that uh, there are kind of legal groups pushing to say that uh, employers could make this mandatory. That is not our intention at this time. Uh, we really want this to be uh, an individual choice. We're trying to provide people the education so they feel comfortable getting the vaccine. I will say early on, what we're hearing across the state is that between 70 and 80% of people who are offered the vaccine uh, in healthcare settings are actually stepping forward um, and saying, yes, please, rolling up their sleeve. I wanted it yesterday. Um, we will see as this plays out, uh, whether that uh, goes down, particularly as we go to the general population. We do need to uh, have, we think about 70% of people say yes. 
Um, and again, a lot of us are asking, when will we return to normal? We will not return to normal until we have 70% of people vaccinated. So um, there, you know, I think there's been a really nice uh, process of bringing these uh, uh, to markets and looking at their safety data and particularly the transparency. We know more about these vaccines, these two mRNA vaccines, than we do about a lot of vaccines when they first launch. And so, yes, they went quick, but we heard a lot about on Friday, the efforts it took to get it there. And it was an army of people around the world doing nothing else but focusing on COVID. And that's actually been the reality of science. If you look at the number of papers written on this one disease in under a year, I mean, it, it, I feel bad for people doing research not on COVID because essentially <laughs> most journals these days are COVID. And uh, so we know a lot more than we did. Um, we will learn a lot more over the next year, but we need people to um, step forward and get vaccinated. We welcome the questions and I really want people to continue to ask those questions. But I do ask that you think about where you're getting your information and particularly be careful with social media. There's a lot of misinformation on social media and people just, you know, if, if it's, um, you know, Uncle Tom on Facebook, say, yeah, where'd you read that? And, and ask, ask those questions. Thank you. I, I think that's a perfect segue because um, one of the reasons we organized this um, webinar was that even as providers, we have a lot of questions, right? And, and you turn to the popular press, you turn the internet, and how do you know if what you're reading is true or not? But I think, um, I mean, I've learned a lot both on uh, Friday session and today. I think that's fascinating actually to me to realize or to recognize that we know more about the vac these COVID-19 vaccines at their rollout than we did for many others, which that we take for granted, right? The way we immunize our children with um, and we get yearly. So I think that's a fascinating piece of information and actually makes us feel much more reassured. Um, in a similar um, uh, topic area, what is the state and DHH doing in terms of uh, promoting information and getting it out there to people of, of various walks of life, of literacy levels? Um, I know obviously sessions like these have been occurring, um, but can, if you could each speak to, briefly um, to those kind of education efforts, because we know education really moves people um, towards science and hopefully towards health. Um, we, we have a dedicated communications branch at the state level. Um, and I think that many of you know that uh, Dr. Chan and myself and Beth Daly and, and others are, are really um, popular in media these days. And, and I'm you know, both sorry and, and glad for that, right? I, I think that um, it's quite appropriate to, to be promoting this, to saying what we know, saying what we don't know. Uh, and getting it out there in lots of different ways. So it, it's a science within public health. Uh, it, it, what's the right way to communicate with what people? Um, this has been a funny one, right? Because we haven't had the information until um, days at this point. So, you know, the, the Moderna EUA just came to us this weekend and I just saw the ACIP come out last night. So, so, you know, how do we quickly translate that into understandable information across multiple languages and culturally appropriate messaging? It's, 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 it's been a, a really um, interesting ride. I would also offer that it's something of a split screen moment, right, where we have this um, raging pandemic, you know, the number, the, the graphic you saw from Dr. Calderwood, these, these, these are keep you up at night kind of numbers, what's happening in our state right now and our record number of deaths and all um, mean that we have to have full attention on those prevention methods and yet moving toward vaccine, how, how do we balance the message of there is light at the end of the tunnel, but it might be months from now, right, that we, we really break the back of this pandemic. So communication is, is challenging. We got this great vaccine, but we have to stay the course in ways that people are, are really tired of, of, of staying the course on. So those are comments I'd make from the state perspective. I'm curious what Michael will say. No, I, mean, I think that it's multimodal. Um, we obviously have uh, gone with uh, print and news and, and radio. There are various campaigns that are going out. But then there are other things that I'm really kind of excited to, to see. So for, you know, Elizabeth and I are going to be on a, a pub panel uh, that uh, <laughs> is another way to spread science. Uh, and uh, we, we have some that are going out into kind of their faith communities and uh, helping to spread the word. And so we have a number of members of the DHH community that 
um, are, are helping um, kind of spread. We've done a lot of work with the schools um, throughout this. And so continuing to work both with preparedness, mitigation and education uh, in the school systems has been a, a big focus. Um, and then there's been a lot of effort um, from various activities people uh, participate in, in terms of advising, whether it be local sports or arts and things like that that have been important. Um, maybe one more comment on that, please, is that I see this absolutely as us equipping you to do the same in your own community, right? So, you know, I, I've given out PowerPoints every which way. If anybody wants these decks, you know, please, um, because we want you to talk to your own community, you as the trusted messenger is going to make far more difference um, than, than uh, you know, a state official or, or somebody that people don't know. So we we're, we're absolutely want you to take this message to your own people. Thank you. It's interesting because as you were both speaking, I was thinking, okay, how has the information I've gained over the past two sessions changed the way I would approach someone who came to me and said, oh, there's no way I'm going to take a vaccine or, you know, uh, I'm scared of this. And I think, right, it's the same as how we counsel patients for anything that they might be hesitant to, you know, whether it's antihypertensives or whether it's, you know, um, a better lifestyle in terms of um, cardiovascular exercise, right? It's you, or at least acknowledge the, the concern or fear, and then you have to move to, well, here's the science that we have and here are the benefits. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's very interesting because I usually think of those emails at the bottom says confidential, do not share. And these days we're saying, no, share this information, right? Here is information from experts and this is gonna help us. Um, and I just, I'm so thankful to both of you for providing this information as well as Katie on Friday um, so that we can um, uh, post this information. And we want people to put it on social media, put it on as many places as you can so that there's the voice of science behind this. Um, so I think that uh, the pub, um, presentations, <laughs> I think will appeal to a lot of people. So I, that's great to hear. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit here. So I think one thing that reassures people in this, in this year of, you know, uncertainty and, you know, and fear at some level or all levels um, is the ability to at least plan or look ahead. And think. So we've had a lot of questions. When can I get a sense of when I will be vaccinated? Yes, we have this, the kind of the hierarchy or the stratification. But let's say, for example, people older, older than 65, I think there's a lot of concern amongst that community. These are people who are largely isolating themselves because of their high risk. Could you give us a, a rough timeline of when we think these um, phased individuals will be vaccinated? Um, I'll start. Uh, that in, Indeed, uh, you've heard already that we're, we believe that phase 1A, given how very large it is, will take one to two months. That's dependent on the um, supply being provided. You know, we, we hit a bit of a glitch with regards to delivery expected today um, at the federal level. Um, they reduced the amount and will give it over the week is what we're told, but we have constant uncertainties around um, the supply chain for vaccine. So remaining nimble there. Um, our phase 1B, which is in uh, draft and will cover some of the population you, you've used as examples here, Laura, um, is, is likely to commence uh, February and extend through March. Our phase two, as shown in the current available plan, um, is, is likely to, um, again, pick up in March and, and it, it, it possibly as late as April, depending on supply. So um, we are putting a Gantt chart online. I think this is a, a really necessary step to, to show that you know, in fact, the the nomenclature of 1A, 1B, 1C, or two, or you know, three or four, like th this is all somewhat artificial because there's a rolling introduction of populations. So, um, um, you know, we, we elected first responders in in 1A because most of our first responders in New Hampshire are actually medically engaged, um, whereas ACIP recommended first responders in Phase 1B as a priority group. So it's somewhat artificial in, in terms of, of this nomenclature. And please pay, I think, attention to the to the Gantt chart for the best estimates when, when you're going to be taken on. Our dashboard for vaccine, I think, will be an incredibly useful tool showing essentially our progress through um, each of the populations, which will give folks a better sense of when they will be taken on as the next population. Yeah, I guess my point on that would be that, um, you know, DHH, other um, uh, 
healthcare providers across the state are really committed to getting this uh, vaccine delivered as quickly as, as it is made available. And so um, as I had shown, what we had received in week one um, really will have been all administered by um, the beginning of this week. We're having plans to kind of stand things up increasingly. So as we take more and more, we're not gonna be sitting on a vaccine. It's going to be delivered as quickly as we are receiving it. And we have that uh, capacity. It is a huge effort, um, but we, what we don't want is things sitting in freezers. We want this vaccine uh, delivered and protecting the public. Great. I think the um, ability to look at a Gantt chart will actually be very reassuring to most, like I said, planning, I think is, is helpful in all regards. Um, Dr. Teller, I have a question for you. So um, recognizing our geographic location and that we have a catchment area for both um, employees as well as patients that spans New Hampshire and Vermont, um, I'm sure without stepping on anyone's toes in Vermont, can you, is this plan for Vermont very similar? We're, we're getting some questions from our audience here. Um, I don't know what Vermont's plan is. <laughs> I'm keeping up with New Hampshire's plans right now. Um, but uh, I, I've seen to date that they follow the ACIP closely, but, but of course nobody's digested the information from the weekend yet. Um, I suspect they'll stay in close. Um, I, I do think also um, it's important for folks to, to see that we're not so much paying attention to state residency uh, right, because we have a lot of cross border in, in all directions. So nobody's getting turned away because they're a Vermont resident and, and similarly New Hampshire folks who are working in Massachusetts are getting vaccinated there. So, so we're believing that um, this, this will come out in the wash. Uh, that's probably gonna be for patients too, wherever you receive your care is where you can get your vaccine or you stay in your own state if you want to go to one of the fixed sites, et cetera. Great. Dr. Calderwood, would you add anything in terms of how DHH looks at these patients or sees these patients? I mean, we're seeing a little bit of differences in terms of um, how we're handling uh, vaccination of uh, providers in the community. And I think that uh, Dr. Talbot alluded a little bit to the state's plan to stand up uh, some freestanding clinics to uh, get to ambulatory providers, um, as well as delivery of vaccine in later phases too. Uh, a broad group of ambulatory providers and, and pharmacies. Um, and so Vermont uh, has a little bit of a different distribution network. Um, so where you get the vaccine will differ a little bit. Okay, great. I think we're gonna, we're gonna wind down. I do have a few questions. One um, that came up um, a fairly uh, granular um, in, in regard to how um, employees here at Dartmouth can receive their vaccines. Um, the question had to do with when and um, physically in time or days um, employees could receive their vaccinations and whether um, the hospital will be um, standing up any nighttime or weekend um, shifts, particularly for those who may be primary caregivers for their children during the day. So um, that actually was a question that I had seen and I will make sure that we are addressing this week. We have been very cognizant of that in prior uh, vaccine efforts, particularly with our fall flu clinics. Um, and so, um, yes, we will uh, need to have logistics to make sure we're getting, uh, we are a 24 seven facility and we know that we have people that work uh, off hours. So we will make sure that we are uh, making vaccine available uh, in line with those. Right, and then a question from your, I think wearing your ID hats for both of you, um, acknowledging that we have a large cancer center here. We did have a question and I wanna acknowledge people who have stayed on this long. Um, those receiving chemotherapy, where do we stand on guidance or, or you know, we'll say big gun immu um, immunosuppression? Where do we stand on vaccinating those individuals? Um, oh, you, oh, you go. I'll just start and then you join. Um, we recognize that this is a subgroup that was inadequately addressed during the vaccine trials of tens of thousands of people. Uh, there, there is some data, but the population size is, is really not uh, robust enough to say that we have full confidence in efficacy. Um, however, there is no safety signal for such. So I, I do believe that um, uh, we, we can gratefully go ahead with vaccinating that population, um, but it might be that we approach it later to, to you know, check for neutralizing antibodies or, or some such, some system that right now is not well-defined, but thank you for 
noting that's a really important population for which we don't know as much as we want to about efficacy, but there's no safety signal or suspected uh, mechanism for increased uh, risk for vaccination. Great. I had answered in the Q&A and the question was around timing of vaccination with regards to administration of cytotoxic chemotherapy. And so like other vaccines, it typically is best to be done prior to um, receipt of a cytotoxic chemotherapy. There are often specific guidelines uh, on the CDC website or from the ACIP. You can pull up tables uh, as to the exact timing. Great. We are, we are at eight o'clock. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us. I think we, we do have three questions that are kind of holdovers that we will address. And I know that we can go a bit longer, but we'll kind of cap it there. Um, for those who have to leave, um, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to um, especially thank Dr. Calderwood and Dr. Talbot, who've been remarkable in um, both their work um, outside of work with their other hats and um, joining all of these type of webinar sessions. This session, like the first, will be posted in its entirety on the YouTube site and it will be accessible from our DHH website. And again, please share this information with friends, family, colleagues, whoever could benefit from more information. So thank you, we'll end um, in terms of uh, a broad-based audience. I will entertain three questions that came up before. Um, the first question has to do um, with uh, lactating mothers, right? Again, so it's kind of a continuation of the pregnancy phenomenon, but can lactating mothers receive a vaccine? What do we know about uh, transmission through the breast milk? And simply, I'll start with yes. You know that that um, we we have a clear statement from ACOG that um, pregnancy and lactation um, are are permissible for vaccination. We we encourage especially pregnant women to consider um, vaccination against the risk of of severe um, outcome from infection itself. So um, uh, it it's not um, a contraindication in, in, indeed for lactation. I don't know um, the breast milk studies to date. Um, maybe Michael does. So I was going to actually um, direct people towards um, our website. And so uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock has been putting together a very large FAQ document where we have uh, specific uh, guidance from some of our uh, obstetricians uh, and pediatricians related to these questions. Perfect. I think this question goes along with it. So the, you, know, you get the shot in your arm. Where do those mRNA ve uh, vectors go and what cells uh, take that up? I mean, is it you know, the muscle cells on the arm, is it, um, immune surveillance cells? And I think that also speaks to kind of would things be expressed in different bodily fluids. Um, could um, perhaps Dr. Calderwood, you could speak to that, what cells are targeted by the vaccine? Yeah, so this is a very kind of uh, local uh, immune response. And then uh, you develop um, kind of uh, fighters that go around throughout the rest of the body, but essentially the mRNA itself is introduced into uh, dendritic cells um, in the muscle where it's injected, and then uh, tends to be transported to uh, a local uh, lymph node, uh, so likely kind of in the armpit or the axilla. Um, there has been some people after the vaccine who've actually noticed some swelling in their armpit as their lymph node swells up and develops the immunity. Um, again, that is short-lived. Um, and then as you develop uh, the antibodies and other immune cells, that is what's circulating around the body, not the mRNA itself. Perfect, perfect. Then the last question we had, um, if someone has had Guillain-Barre before, we know there's not a large safety signal coming out so far, but what would be the advisor um, to them right now in terms of receiving the uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccines? So there were no cases of uh, Guillain-Barre in the two large clinical trials. We obviously know that uh, this is a rare uh, outcome with a uh, flu vaccine when you're vaccinating millions and millions of people. And we will have to uh, look in the um, kind of large administration as we begin to roll this out across larger populations. Um, it is not expected to be an outcome from mRNA uh, vaccines. And in general, um, the guidance is the vast majority of vaccines are totally safe in people with a history of Guillain-Barre. And specifically, it's felt to be safe to receive either the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine if you've had a history of Guillain-Barre, uh, even including following a flu vaccine. Exactly. Thank you. I'm glad for that answer. That's just what I would have said. Excellent. On the same page and perfect. Well, again, I want to thank you both. 
Um, do either of you have any uh, closing remarks, anything you'd like to share with our audience? We'll start with Dr. Talbot. Uh, unprepared, um, but but I would say um, I, I do appreciate this opportunity for um, that chance to um, help you have your questions answered so that you can do the same thing within your communities. I do feel we're at a tipping point. We could break the back of this pandemic finally, um, but it's going to take us months. So please do have that split screen mentality where we continue to adhere the communi community um, mitigation methods. Um, and stay tuned for the evolving um, guidance that um, is inevitable in the next weeks and months. So really thank you and stay safe out there. And I, I would say the same thing, which is to say we finally have a light at the end of the tunnel and the tunnel may not be as short as we would like it to be. I long for the day where I can remove my mask and have a giant bonfire with my friends and uh, uh, that we can go traveling and all the places that we've had to put off. That will come, it is on the horizon but we need to continue to do a lot of the same things we've been doing for a number of months more as we get this vaccine rolled out. Um, I ask when it is your turn that you um, look at the evidence and make a choice, but really I would encourage all to roll up their sleeve and get the vaccine. This is a, a truly a hopeful time. Great, thank you both. And I will say as an anesthesiologist, I'm actually set to receive mine later this morning. So. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and thank you to all of our participants. Again, this um, session will be posted um, and we look forward to hopefully more optimistic times in the future. Thank you.